for like the last three days. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! All right, we're live. I snuck it in on them. They didn't know what was going on. Anyways, this is LinuxInstall.net, episode 102. I am your host, Brian Wagner. With me are my co-hosts, Mr. Joseph Luzzi. Hello, Brian. Mr. Greg Martin. What's up, interwebs? And the newest member of the Linux Install crew, Mr. Walt Giavec. Hey. All right. So, um... I'm going to start off because I actually did something with Linux this week. <laughs> Not just... <laughs> oh, yeah! <laughs> I actually got to play... No, I've been playing with Linux the whole time. Is that even legal, Brian? Yeah, yeah. I actually had to write Python scripts this week for Linux. I was very happy. <laughs> That's a very happy... Wow! Yeah. Yep. Yep, nobody else could figure out how to write a Python script. Don't ask me. It, Anyways, because it's so hard. It is that difficult. It wasn't PowerShell, so they didn't have to do it. I was going to say, because they know PowerShell. <laughs> or VB. VB's or close. Or C Sharp. There's a couple of them know C Sharp pretty well. Anyways, so uh, besides doing that, I also managed to get, finally, Google Drive working on my Linux machine. And I thought this project was new until I actually went and did some research on the project itself. And I guess it's been around for a while, and I just somehow missed it. So I downloaded the software. Um, it's called Grive, and it you know puts up the whole little googly icon on your task bar thing in your notification section. Um, it does actually sync all of the real, not Google Docs docs. That's the only thing. It doesn't do Google Docs. Doesn't sync Google Docs. Um, but any real documents, photos, anything else that you put up there, all get synced without a problem. It pulls them all do down. It keeps them in sync. Is there a reason it doesn't do those particular docs? Um, I mean, is that stated anywhere in the documentation, or is it's, something yeah, they're working it's on? Documentation. The guy said if he got lots of call for it, he would go back and put that in. The guy who wrote the the software. Mm -hmm. It's all open source, so you can go go look at it, and you could add it if you wanted to. Um, but he said, it, really looking at what it does, just from extrapolating on what it does on the Windows and Mac clients, all it does is open a browser, hmm. so it's not. He's like, I could do it. It wouldn't wouldn't be too much work, but it doesn't seem to have a lot of benefit. If you got to open the browser anyways to get to be able to see the doc, you might as well just go to the website and open right. it there. True. True that. But, for instance, it was Python scripts. I was editing the Python scripts on my Linux box and sending them to other people on my Windows box. Cause, I don't know why, actually. Because you just wanted to be different. It. I could have just as easily opened up a web browser and gone to Office 365, but I decided not to. I was being cool because I got it to work. But it was which, really cool. Which, hilariously enough, has a better experience on my Linux box than it does on Windows. Isn't that funny, though? Yeah. It I, I, no, seriously, so seriously it, it works so much better on Linux. Um, yeah, if you're ever thinking about trying Linux at work, um, if you're a Linux admin and you're stuck with a Windows laptop because... Well, that's what the whole company uses. You could actually, if you're on Office 365, you could easily get away with just using the browser-based version of Office. It works really well. Firefox or Chrome both don't have any problems with it. And it looks different on different browsers, too, if you haven't noticed that yet, Greg. Yeah. Yeah, it also does not work under the latest version of IE very well, either. Which is absolutely hilarious, yes. Yeah, all the, the spreadsheet cells in Excel, forget about it. You type something you type something in and it like literally offsets the cell by like two pixels, and then the next one over is further down and then it gradually slopes. Nice. It's great. It's a feature. It's a feature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the sand sloping spreadsheet. <laughs> Yep, it's still not good enough, though, that I'm going to leave uh, Gmail anytime soon. But for work, it's what we use. It's all good. Um, what's everybody else been up to? Besides playing, if you guys didn't catch from the beginning of the jokes about South Park. Besides everybody playing South Park, what else did we do this week? Didn't play South Park? It's kind of about it. 
I was the only one who didn't. <laughs> I, I set up a... Uh... I didn't either. Oh, okay, well, that's two against two, so it's not that bad. Yes, yeah, I, I set up a um, server to run Sickbeard, which is a uh, web-based DVR software. Huh. Now, that's um, interesting. Basically, some fancy Python scripts is what it comes down to. Could have got Brian uh, to help you. Yeah. But it's all prepackaged, alpha state. But, um, yeah, I just uh, rolled up a little VM and got all that working. I got the uh, VM installed last night, opened up a few ports of my firewall, worked on it from work today because I don't really do real work some days. <laughs> <laughs> I just and, need to uh, get home and, you know, hang out yep. for a while. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, we're pretty good. Wait, you're so, expanding. You're expanding your knowledge, though, Walt. I mean, that's you're you're experimenting and you're just expanding your your knowledge of things. So it's 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 still considered work. Yeah, that's true. And I gotta circumvent, you know, works firewalls and stuff to do my stuff. So you're it's learning kinda, security when you're doing that. Just kind of, yeah, kind of. Yeah, kinda, yeah. He's, he's kind of like pen testing his own house, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so, so so it's a, so it's a DVR solution. I mean, do you, do you have like cameras in your house, like IP cams, or are you doing it with something else? No, for TV. Oh, okay. Um, and then it accepts multiple sources, um, from where the video can come from. Hmm. I haven't gotten as far as to actually pulling the video yet, but I got all my shows scheduled. It scans like uh, the TV database and IMDb for information and it populates all the story info and you can use it to keep track of like which shows you've watched if you have to go back and like you know check other ones and stuff so it's pretty cool wow so you just do you have any tuners to hook up to it or yeah I have a HD home run um, dual tuner that I might okay. see how that works and then um, you know you can pull from other various questionably legal sources that like are, Aereo. That are We're talking about things like Aereo, right? Right. Well, that's questionably illegal now, too. <laughs> that's what I was saying. <laughs> it's a large corporation, but still, they've lost some significant lawsuits recently. I don't. I still don't understand how they're losing, but... Just keep using them until they blow up. Uh, I'd like to use them, but they're not offered. Because I would... That would if, if I could get rid of cable... Area, a solution like Aereo would be one of my be one of my choices for ways to get rid of it. Just yeah. change your just change your user agent string, you'll be okay. <laughs> I mean, we've been looking at that, or a buddy and I, another friend, um, we've been watching that for like a long time now, waiting for it to come in our area, which now looks like it's never going to happen. Right, it's been um, coming soon for a year now. <laughs> yep. Bud got uh, was it H. D head end, I believe it's called the Linux backend to record, um, which integrates with X XBMC. Uh, okay. So you can watch live stream TV and then record and stuff, and it's got the you know scheduler and whatnot, and that works okay. Um, I'm probably gonna end up setting up a Myth TV server again because it's just the best, I think, out of all the free solutions. And isn't there still there's a front end a uh... Plug-in for XBMC to Myth, isn't there? Yep. Yep. That's what I because the only thing I didn't like about Myth was the, and it's probably gotten better since I looked at it last, but the front end was pretty um, engineered designed. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> I mean, the nice thing, I mean, depending upon your time frame, you can have it record and then transcode and place the files in any folder you want that any other media playback player can then read and play back. So, I mean, even if you had, like, a Western Digital, you know, uh, live player or, you know, you're running Plex, you know, as long as the files get dumped in the right place, you know, it'll it'll still pull it out. So you don't necessarily even have to use their client, if, uh, which I probably right. wouldn't. You know, I'd use XBMC, like you said, just with the, the back-end plug-in. Right. Because the, the only thing I would need to connect to Myth for, because you could do all that scheduling some other way, the only reason I would need to connect to that is to watch live stream stuff and be able to pause live TV. Right. Yeah, I can't tell you the last time I watched live TV. Is it really Other called than live? the news. I was going to say, is it really called live TV? I mean, is it really live if it's pre-recorded? 
No, I'm. Well, I mean, there's that. I guess people watch the Oscars. I didn't, but I hear other people did. What's the Oscars? Yeah. I, I, I don't know he's this little about. he's this little green thing that's in a can on Sesame Street. <laughs> hey, you know what? He was awesome. All right, <laughs> I grew up with that guy. Um, yeah, the the event that's called the Super Bowl for women. That was Super the, Bowl for women. <laughs> that's how it was described. My my mother's and I guess they did take down Twitter during the Oscars. True. My mother was trying really? to. Really? Yeah. Wow. Oh, you hadn't heard that, Craig? Yeah. No. I heard they were actually having issues. Oh, yeah. Just, just shit. Everybody man. was talking about it. It's the first time we've seen the fail whale in a long time. Yeah. Fail yeah. whale. And it, and it no, only no. happened for a few minutes and they were back. Yeah, Ellen tweeted a selfie. That's what took it down. Right. Oh, my God. Well, it was more than just a single selfie, though. She was. Well, yeah, it was one. kind of. And it was very staged. Them, but still. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was yeah, a very think. staged selfie. Yeah, think there was nothing real about that at all. That and the pizza that they had delivered. So, um, so wait a minute. So that was Walt. Joe said nothing. I was doing some research today, and one of the things I was looking at was a way to actually record audio from a Google Hangout. Cool. And one of the podcast websites that I ended up on, some guy said he was using like Sony Sound Studio or something. I'm guessing like Acid Pro to do some of the recording. So I was looking at alternatives, and I found Linux Multimedia Studio, which I was going to download and play with this week. Oh, in my Fedora cool. box. So cool. You're going to give me the link to that, right? So I can put that up. It's coming your way now. I will put that in the show notes. Just you're not else. you're you're not supposed to share industry secrets, Joe. <laughs> so, oh, and Walt, I need the link to yours too. Um. So, Greg, did we talk about you? I don't think we did. Did we? You always talk about me, Brian. You talk about me behind my back. You talk about me when I leave to go get hot dogs, or you know, talk about you when you're sitting here too. What's your point? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm actually starting to screw around with Vala, and it's it's kind of interesting. Vala is the C sharp like programming language for the GNOME party, I guess if you want to call it the GNOME party, kind of like you know, I don't know. It basically just abstracts the whole uh, glib and G object libraries and lets you write to that in C-sharp, and it compiles down to C, basically. It's kind of like the more modern method of writing GTK apps, if you're going to be doing, like, GTK3 programming. I about that before. Okay, yeah. so that's what that's for. Yeah, there's, like, six people in the world that use it, so... So far, I, so far I kind of like it. I mean, I'm not a real big C-sharp guy, Um I have a couple friends who swear by C sharp. I mean, they would probably take a bullet for C sharp if somebody shot at it. Um, it's kind of hard for me to to handle the syntax. I mean, it's it's you know C sharp's always like Java. Everybody makes comparisons between Java and C sharp, but it, it's actually a little different. It feels different. Um, but I like. I mean, it's a hell of a lot better using. Vala than it is writing GTK apps in C because that is a real pain in the ass. Yeah, I can imagine that. I mean, it, there's a lot of libraries and stuff to have to try to remember to pull in for. A lot of yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's more mundane stuff too. I, I mean, there's I can go into a whole bunch of stuff like mindless casting and boxing and unboxing and and all this other stuff. And by the time you get a simple window up with C code, you've got like 50 lines and it looks like a cat just shit all over your monitor. But I, I do like I, I do like what I'm getting with Vala and I'd like to see if I take some of the more uh, modern design, uh, like take some of the more modern design approaches with the newer version of GTK and make some just like demo apps with it and see what happens. Cool. All right, does anybody else have anything else to add? 
talking about this week? Yeah, one of the other things I found when I was doing the research earlier that I forgot about was I sent you another link to something. It's actually called Audio Recorder. Um, it's an application for the GNOME 3 and Ubuntu's Unity desktops. It will actually just record pretty much any sort of audio on your computer. Coming from your speakers, mics, anything for you. Wow. So that was one of the other things. So I'm going to have to probably... I don't even know if I have um, Ubuntu VM anymore. If I do, it's very old. So I'm going to have to build a new VM and play around with that as well this week. <laughs> So, uh, why are you looking for this, by the way? I'm oh, my mind, but... God. Do you really do you want to get him started on this? <laughs> let's, we, let's take this. This has nothing to do with the, the Linux show right now. We'll just take this uh, offline right. and talk about it afterwards. <laughs> Fine. You're just looking up Linux solutions. I'm just saying. Just, you know? just, Brian, be ready to fall asleep at this explanation that's going to be coming your way because he's just going to go off <laughs> on a tangent. Maybe we should record that as like a side-along podcast. <laughs> Joe's, Joe's Joe rants. rants. Because Joe <laughs> rants are pretty good, so, you know. <laughs> what? Now you're speechless? I didn't, no, I just... I was I, just trying to find a way to record audio from the Google Hangout. And I do have other... I do have several options already. But in, in my research, this these are a couple of the things I ran into. They're cool. Thank you for calling. Anyways, let's move on. I gotta change this section title because it doesn't make any sense. But so um, this is a continuation <laughs> of last week's debates about the um, the best, worst, what we're using type debate. Now we went over kind of what we were using personally, on a personal level last week. Um, I'm actually gonna save off the one for the professional stuff, and we'll do that next week. And we're going to talk about why you might want to use, because we have some arch, arch love in the crowd, uh, some users of Gentoo, as well as, you know, versus Fedora or Red Hat products. Or Who uses Fedora? Ubuntu, Mint type stuff. What, are you back on Gentoo now? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Walt. No, Walt's yeah. the arch fan. Yeah, I'm the arch guy, man. He's arch. Uh, all right, well, so tell us a little bit about what, what is Arch, why does it exist as a separate distro? Um, Arch, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is maybe the only or definitely one of the only true 100% uh, rolling release distributions. So they don't come out with updates every six months. You know, whatever you're running, you just keep getting patched upgrades till they decide not to put out package upgrades anymore. Um, their documentation wiki, uh, again, in my opinion anyways, is the best of any distribution out there. In fact, no matter what I'm running, I always go to the Arch wiki to learn how to set up whatever tool it is I'm running, no matter what the distribution is. Um, and the nice thing is, which is also why a lot of people don't run it, is there's really nothing set up for you. They make you do everything on your own. So a new user who's used to just rolling a, you know, Ubuntu install and you got wireless working, you got sound working, you got video working, X is coming up, all your office suites already installed. <clears throat> if you're going to do that in Arch, they drop you in a command line. And you picked a network driver during install, and that was about it. So everything <laughs> else you got to configure by hand. So it's a little more difficult. But I like it, and I, I don't use it on a desktop. I've set it up before, and it's not horrible. Um, but I love it for servers because you start with a bare minimum, no frills, nothing base. And when you install a individual application that you need, um, it's not going to have all this other package stuff that goes with it. And then because you have to actually configure it, you know exactly where the files are being stored, you know you know where your configuration is, you know which user is accessing it. So it forces you to be a little more hands-on versus if I had you know a Debian server, I apt get it. Sure, it's up and running in four seconds, but I have no idea what it did. And you know, as a server admin, I should probably have a little more idea of what happened. 
Um, the other cool thing is, at least up until most recently, is it was one of the few distributions that supported the ARM architecture. So for years, on all of my embedded devices, um, I've been running the Arch Linux ARM spin, if you will, and uh, it works really, really good. Um, Debian did it. It was the other, its competitor, I guess, or alter, alternative option, but um, it wasn't nearly as complete until the latest, you know, within the last year where everybody jumped on the ARM bandwagon and, you know, now you got better support across the distros, but Arch did it for years, and it, they, they did it really good. And here's my cat. Kitty! <laughs> 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 So whenever I need to set up a server, <laughs> with rare exception, it's going to be an Arch server. With a cat. Uh, with a cat, yep. And he's trying to chew my microphone cord. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've always thought starting people off on the easy stuff, like Ubuntu or even Senos or Fedora, is pretty simple to set up. Like everything pretty much sets itself up. But you just made a relatively good point of you know, you probably should understand where the file, at least where and what's in the files for the stuff that you're setting up. Right. And honestly, um, networking can be a bit hairy, but besides networking, Apache or MySQL, I've set those all up by hand because the tools didn't exist to do it any other way before. Correct. Um, I'm the same started, boat. <laughs> when I started, they didn't exist, so I didn't have a choice. I had to do it by hand. Um, and all of those are relatively easy to set up beyond that. I mean, you know, you have to you have to do a little reading, um, and they aren't tuned necessarily when you get them functional. Right. Because there's a difference between functional and functioning. Right. Um, or optimal, as far as that goes. Right, Joe? Joe knows all about See. optimizing configurations. <laughs> <laughs> See? He gets to fight with software every day. Well, and the nice thing, too, is I have, you know, uh, students that come to me for Linux help, and they are doing everything through some sort of GUI that, you know, Fedora is going to do it differently than Ubuntu is going to do it, or the tools may not even exist from one distro to another. And doing this, basically everything through command line for the most part, with you know, bare metal, for lack of a better description, applications, you're going to be able to set it up wherever you want to set it up. So, you know, you're learning low-level knowledge. Did you, so, tell them, did, did you tell them GUIs are for wussies? Yeah, yeah, and then they just go, yeah, but this is my one Linux class that's required for graduation, and then I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't, I, dude, that was how it was in college for me. It's, everybody was like, man, I really, I, I don't want to take this unit class. Can you just, like, not do this stuff in the command line because I don't care. Yeah. But. See, and, and then... See, I mean, but like Brian, when we started, I mean, I started off with DOS back in the day. So when I jumped over to the Linux world from the Windows side, I was like, okay, I did this 15 to 18 years ago. I'm like, I'm used to command line. That's how I started. No big deal to me. <laughs> Yep. Nobody knew coming up those like that, though. Yeah. I mean, they don't, you know. See, how, how, many, how many X windows does Greg got? One, one. year. <laughs> one, X one X window. <laughs> hey, man, you know what? I started off with GUIs, right? But I love Terminal. It's so fuzzy and warm feeling to me. I, I really just, I love it. Well, I just wrote a blog post on my other, on my DevOps Mastery site. And the whole thing was, if you can't do things with scripts, which means if you can't figure out how to do them from the command line, you you may not be able to be a system admin for much longer. Because even Windows is getting rid of the, the, the GUI for administration sure. purposes. Mm -hmm. Like it's basically the GUI in 2012. If you don't, if you do the default install, the GUI in 2012 is more or less just a server status page that tells you what services are running and it'll let you restart the services. Um, that's it. Anything else you want to do, you want to change network addresses, you want to do anything else, you better know PowerShell and you better know how to do it. You better learn it pretty quick if you don't already know it. Um, because I have a feeling, whatever the next one is, 2014, 2015, um, 
may eliminate the GUI altogether and just say, no, just do it with PowerShell. So, Isn't it funny how the Windows guys just cringe when they think about that? Most of them. I, I, I don't know if they'll ever get rid of it fully. They may strip it down and there may be... Well, you have the option to now install it headless, which is basically just, you know, oh, yeah. command line. I have a feeling they'll stick with that. I don't know if they're going to get rid of the GUI altogether. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Well, they may bring back the, the classification of small business server and leave that with the one as the GUI and call the enterprise server not do it. I could see them doing that. Because a, a small business wouldn't necessarily have the skills, have the people with the skills to do that. Right. Well, you know what? They're not going to do that. You know why? Because that's probably the smart thing to do. So <laughs> now that you said that, that's just kind of that's just <laughs> thanks, Brian. That can't happen. That can't happen now, because that makes sense. It does. Yes, I'll agree. It does. It does make sense. So they're a large corporation. They can't make that decision. That's correct. Um. All right. So who can talk about Gen two, or do I have to? I think you have to. I, I can't say. I, I can't say anything about it, man. I, I tried it. I didn't feel like waiting for everything to build on my slow ass machine at the time. In other words, she just said, "Fuck it, I'm done. <laughs> Don't yep. want to do it." All right. So, the original genesis of Gentoo, and the original thought behind Gentoo was, you would compile everything that you need for your machine. You wouldn't necessarily have to do all the build commands themselves, but as you installed packages, instead of downloading a binary package and installing it. You would download all of the source code, compile the code. It would then be optimally compiled for your machine. It, it's a great theory. It works. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. There's plenty of people that do it. Um, but to Walt's point, there's working and how long do you want to work for it? And um, even now with faster processors, just because of the number of packages you need to, you need to configure and build, to get things to work, um, it takes a long time. And, and it's not a long working time necessarily because it's like, you know, well, I want to install this set of packages and then it goes out and it, it helps you do that. Uh, things like choosing what kernel drivers, you, you got to really geek out on the hardware before you can go through and really optimally install Gen 2 because you kind of really have to know what hardware you have. Um, and then if you decide to stick in some new USB device that's not a standard, you know, it's not a keyboard or mouse or a mic, uh, yeah, keyboard or mouse. I'm not sure microphones would fall into that same category, but keyboards or mouse, um, you're going to probably have to install other drivers to go with that, whereas um, Ubuntu, Fedora, I'm not so sure about Arch, but Ubuntu and Fedora would have those drivers kind of built in. Arch probably depends on what it is. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, Fedora and Ubuntu derivatives, you know, of Red Hat and, and, Ubuntu, and Debian, really, not Ubuntu, but Debian, have large groups of stuff that could be installed. And the other ones, the further you get away from Debian, for instance, like when you get to Linux Mint, the more stuff, the more extra stuff that's installed, whether you want it or not, whether you need it or not. And so the idea with Gen 2 is Gen 2 is... Gen 2 and Arch share that minimal possible, but Gen 2 takes it to that next level of where you're going to compile everything optimally for your CPU, for your uh, controllers, your PCI bus, everything. All your chipsets, on all the chips on your machine, all your chipsets, video drivers, everything is compiled to order for your machine. In reality, you should end up with a super fast machine. And you probably will. Oh, yeah. But it, it will take you a really long time to get there. And you know what? Installing an SSD will probably get you as much performance gain. <laughs> well, you remember the package was, uh, or the you know, distro came out 15 plus years ago. Squeaking every little bit of performance out of hardware was really important. Right. You know, and like now, like you said, with the advances in technology and everything so cheap. You know, unless you're doing something where you still need that level of tweakage. Well, not only that, but just as soon as we started getting into multi-core processors, multi-core, multi-thread processors, 
and they started optimizing for the multicolor multi-thread processors like the new versions of the kernel are you know that stuff's all moving so fast and it's got so many paths to go down and the memory bandwidth is so much larger that you just you've you've lost the return you know the benefit basically of doing it not lost it because it would still be faster um, and if I was building you know when I would use it if I was going to build like a core i7 machine with 16 gigs of RAM to mine bitcoins with like 16 different video cards in there or however many I could cram into the machine and I wanted to optimally get all the drivers tuned and everything that's when I would use Gen 2 because it would be super fast super efficient wouldn't be wasting a lot of time but I'll bet the right person installing Arch could probably get almost as much performance. Probably not lose that much. It'd be close. So, so that's Gen 2. Hopefully everybody's heard about Fedora and Red Hat. Does anybody? Nope. Don't know what you're talking nope. about. No, no, I can't say. <laughs> Red Hat? But that's a distro? That's what a they, oh. distro. <laughs> so Sorry. one of the important things to point out is all of these could be although it depends on where they're at in their cycles, but at certain points, all of them are running the same version of the kernel, so they're all running the same base thing. They may not all be running the same packages on top, but they'll be pretty close, generally. Um, I can't think of what else I was going to say about that. Oh, package managers are, are the big difference between these. Arch has Pac-Man, yep. correct? Mm -hmm. I cannot remember what Gen 2 is now. Gen 2 has its own... Yep. Um, that I don't remember. Sorry, folks. And Fedora Red Hat derivatives are RPMs, and Ubuntu or really Debian derivatives are apt. Or Portage. That. Yeah. Is that Gen two? Yeah, I was just looking it up too. <clears throat> Thank y'all. Mm -hmm. So here's a little fun fact about Fedora, and I don't know if you guys know this or not. Did you know Fedora's name actually came from? the group that submitted packages to Red Hat Linux called Fedora Linux. No. Yeah. Nope. There you go. Did they get absorbed? Did the people on that team get hired by Ubuntu? I'm, not, sure. I'm not sure what happened to them. I would assume so. Uh, because was... because Fedora is, the, that, the name Fedora is trademarked by Red Hat. So I yeah. would assume that the people on that project somehow got assimilated into Red Hat in some way. Well, most of the developers on Fedora work for Red Hat because Fedora right. is their farm team. Mm -hmm. That's where they do, I mean, for all intents and purposes, like we were talking about last week, that is the upstream from Red Hat versions of the server. So it, um, it makes sense that they would work for them. I mean, that's where the majority of the stuff is. Not where all of it comes from, though, because there's a large portion of Red Hat stuff that is, not, is done by outside companies. Mm-hmm. Um, the likes of IBM, uh, Hitachi, a bunch of the hardware vendors, all write drivers specific to that version um, of Linux, as well as IBM has certain arrangements with them for running Red Hat on the mainframe. So there's some extra stuff on there because you can actually run Red Hat Linux and SUSE Linux bare metal on the mainframe. If you really wanted to, it works. We do it. Well, you're doing it with the coprocessors, aren't you? you aren't We're doing, doing it with the IFL. The IFL, right? Which is kind of a coprocessor, but you can actually right. run it. On, yeah, I, yeah, on I think there's a way you, you can. Yeah. Which is kind of funny because I'd rather run it in the IFL because that makes a lot more sense. Because <laughs> the IFL is supposed to be really fast. But, anyways. Um, so what does anybody have to say about Fedora or Red Hat? I mean, I, I wanted to introduce Arch and Gen 2. Um, Joe and I think I'm the only Debian Ubuntu type fan. Joe and Greg, you're both in the Red Hat camp, right? Amen, brother. Yeah, I mean, I used to use Mint a while ago, but I kind of switched over to Red Hat. <clears throat> I mean, especially yeah, I mean, since that's pretty much what we're using at work now. And that's why I think I kind of just got back into Fedora a little bit more, sticking with that. Like we said last time, I do Ubuntu for my desktop because it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> True. So is, so is Fedora. Yeah. Fedora's easy for desktop. 
You know, I, yeah, Fedora is easy, but Fedora doesn't look that good. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I love GNOME 3, man, and I'm probably the only person who will openly admit that I love GNOME 3. Now, I just, I don't know, for some reason Ubuntu has better graphics people. The, the graphics f- look a little better. The, the you gotta font. remember, I'm coming from the Mac, man. The no, Mac you're, you're is, spoiled. Is you're the spoiled. epitome of of really good design, good yeah visuals. I, uh, I, I will say this: the Ubuntu. It seems like, and this, I, I'm not up with the technical on this or anything like that. It seems to me like the font rendering in Ubuntu just looks a lot nicer than it does in Fedora, and I'm not sure why. It just looks a little bit different to me. From what I've read before, it's choice. It's it's the choice of fonts. It's not necessarily I, the rendering itself. Okay, I was just gonna say that. Yeah. I use because I use. Uh, I don't use Cantarell on Fedora. I use Caldera, which is I think is one of the newer fonts that they put out for 20. And then when I'm on Ubuntu, I use their actual font, like the Ubuntu font the, with you know the mono and all that other kind of stuff too. But I use Ubuntu Lite. I don't use the book size. And I always have the hinting down to like slight in RGB. It just looks better. Yes. But I still like my GNOME 3. I don't mind GNOME. Um, I don't mind GNOME 3. I'm not a huge... Even though I use Ubuntu, I'm not a Unity fan. Um, so I usually end up switching to... That's why I've switched to Mint. Plus, mm-hmm. Mint has that whole bunch... Okay, so I said before, the farther downstream you get from Debian, or Red Hat for that matter the more stuff that's pre-installed. And Mint just installs a whole bunch of codecs and other things that I would just install and configure anyways, but I don't have to because it's already there. The same time, that also means I have a bunch of junk on here that I probably could get rid of. But my hard drive's so big... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, Brian, Brian, uh, Brian's walking <laughs> down the street. My hard drive's so big! Well, okay, okay, so that's, it's, that's just like last year, I think it was, when I started playing around with that Amiga Vision, which is basically just um, it was a Mint variant. Uh huh. I mean, and and that even I don't want to say it had more stuff on there than Mint. It just had alternative stuff on there to Mint. Right. You know, than what came with Mint. I mean, but like the font and everything like that looked like the old school Amiga, you know, font and everything like that. I mean, it and the windows looked like that. It was it was kind of cool. You know, but it was it was it was mint underneath is all it was. Yeah, but somebody took some time to actually tweak the oh definitely the window configurations and stuff like that. Yeah, but um, oh, I'm trying to think where I was. You were bashing on Unity. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, I'm just I'm not so I end up putting mint or something else on there. Oh, the mint stuff, like there's stuff on mint that I'll never use. And I could take the time to uninstall it, but I don't know. And then when I compare my Linux VMs to what I have to do for a Windows VM, I mean, come on. I can install any version, the heaviest version of Linux on less than 10 gigs, on a 10 gig drive, and have tons of space to play with. And a ton more applications. And a ton more applications. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) And I, just to install Windows have to start with a 40 gig VM disk. Before you patch it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Pre-patch, 20 yes. gig. Post-patch. No yeah, post-patch. Yeah, no <laughs> apps, no nothing. I mean, because when I was running, when, my last company, when I was running Linux as my OS, and I was using a VM for, for Windows, I was dual booting, or, well, actually, most often I was, I'd partition the drive, and I was reading created a virtual disk out of a physical partition. And that physical partition kept filling up. And I split the disk. And I'm on the Linux side going, I, I got like 10 gig left. And on the Windows side, I'm totally full. Why am I totally full? I don't understand. Oh, it's because we're going to keep every patch we've ever applied to the machine, never delete anything, because we might need to go back 12 versions for some reason. I was say, you might want to, you might have to do a system restore, Brian. Yeah. I don't understand it. It's not like I couldn't go download it again. 
just not the way it works. You really want to download it again? You want you want to go through that pain of downloading shit through Windows Update? Yeah, I turned on a machine at work today that hadn't been turned on in a year, and there was like 156 <laughs> oh, updates waiting oh. for the first reboot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the part. Okay, so all right, let's. Well, I guess we'll bash on, on. Uh, we might as well. We might as well just keep going, man. We might as well just all keep right. going. That's the other thing that drives me nuts about Windows, right? You're gonna replace all the code that's there, anyways. Why do I have to reboot and then download still more patches? Why can't you just give me all the patches at once? Just give me all of them and then tell me to reboot. Yeah, that makes sense. But no, you have to download a few patches, reboot, and it's never just a few. But you know, even after their service packs out, like you have to download patches before you can install the service pack, which always cracks me up. And then install the service pack, and then install more patches after the service pack. Because right, yep. you know, unless you're installing the month the service pack came out, there's been a patch Tuesday. Yep. Like today. Yeah, like today. Each update requires, you know, something from a prior update, and they just don't have the back end written to push it all. Like, you know, you'd have let's just say there's a thousand updates, you'd have to have a thousand variants of what you would send to an individual, depending upon what state their box was in. Yeah, but you can do dependency trees. Come on, Linux can do it. Well, yeah, that's because Linux is cool. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have anything as cool as the registry, man. Oh God. Oh God. Thank yeah, that was okay. a fun we've, discussion. We've, we've gone off on too far of a tangent if we're talking about the registry now. <laughs> hey, man, you know what? The other this day, just needs to stop. The other day at work, this is how bad it is. The other day at work, I actually had to screw around with the registry editor. That's when I know it got bad. I have to do it on a regular basis, but that's just... Yeah, me too. Yeah, so. The sad thing is, I don't, I'm not even afraid to go into the registry anymore. I'm not either. I just I, I just think it's completely freaking insane that it gets to that point where you have to actually go in there and start screwing around to fix a screensaver problem because some dickhead downloaded a, a registry script, ran it against the PC, and now the whole thing's broken. <laughs> and all they wanted to do, right, here, here's the reason why they did it. The, ad, the group policies locked the screensaver tab on, on the uh, display properties on the XP machine. So they wanted to stop the screensaver from coming up. What did they do? They downloaded a little batch script that ran the registry key mod against the whole PC for all the users. Well, cool. Now you can't turn the damn thing on because you didn't you A didn't know what you were doing and B, you didn't even look at the damn file to see what was there. You just downloaded it and ran it. So why did they have access to do that? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> I have no idea why they were able to do that. Yet another group policy fail. Anyways, AD for win. All right, um, we're gonna stop complaining about Windows now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it can my go hot, too far. My hot dog just cold. Did it? Um, yeah. yeah. The only thing I'll say is, regardless of what uh, Leo Laporte says on his wonderful talk show, please upgrade to something other than XP. I don't care what he and Steve Gibson say about how you can make it safe to still run XP. Most people can't. Don't try it. It's not... If you have to run an, XP, an app that only runs on XP, run it in a virtual machine and upgrade to 7. I mean, jeez. Or better yet, stop using the damn app. Well, well I'll tell you what. what there's, there's some games got... that you probably can't run. Well, it's not just that, man. No, no, it's not just games. Like I, and I'm thinking more from the corporation standpoint. And maybe this is just my, this is me not blending well with enterprise. But it's like I, I feel like it's an irresponsible move from a company that does in-house apps that they don't upgrade their shit. So it runs on the newer versions, and they just keep, you know, they're like, oh my god, the XP machines have to come out. So let's keep putting all this crap that uses COM on Windows 7, and it just breaks, and nobody bothers to fix it. That's just irresponsible. That describes every company I've ever worked with. But That's bullshit. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> well, I'm in a boat where I have to run apps for companies that don't exist anymore, so they couldn't update it. That's even better. Wonderful. That's awesome. So and of course, could, you don't have the source code either, so it's not no. like you could... Call Joe's, call Joe's Crab Shack and get a dev from there. 
Yeah, and and it's to program hardware. So I mean, you got to use it. Otherwise, I can't use my hardware. Well, that's why they have reverse and nobody, compilers nobody first and hacked it. I guess uh, not. It's probably pretty niche. Yeah, no, I just keep an old Dell like 620 sitting there with XP on it and all those programs, and I turn it on the three times a year. I got to reprogram the box. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> See, I would be worried that, that that one of those years you're going to try to boot that box and it's just not going to boot. So yeah, that's I, would, I would personally, I would personally P to V it because then no matter what, you're always going to be able to boot. True. Virtual machine. Because you can still boot DOS on a virtual machine. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. And you know, DOS hasn't been supported for almost a great year. Almost a great. Oh my ah. god. <laughs> really. Hey, I'm gonna be 27 this year. What are you gonna do when that happens? Well, nothing. Yeah, but it'll it'll still be the same distance away that it stopped being supported. So Son of it a will bitch. also be 27 years. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get away from it. <laughs> Damn it. Nope. I tried. Yes. I I will I will <laughs> accept my moniker and I will wear it proudly. All right, we should be done bashing on the windows. Um. Yeah. Anyways, um, I'm going to uh, post. Well, I'm not going to post much about this because you know we just talked it all through. But the I still haven't posted yet, but I will post everybody's picks for the last podcast up here shortly. And uh, next week we're going to be talking about our choice of distros for small business servers. Like what we would recommend to a small business versus what we would recommend to an enterprise, if there is a difference between us. We'll kind of have a discussion about that. So that'll be next week. Um, does anybody have anything else before I wrap this up? Go wrap it up. Go twice. We're done. done. All right. Follow us on Twitter as at Linux install. Um, if you go to our About Us pages page, you can find out how to follow each of us individually. You can follow Linux install on the community page. If you go out and search Google Plus for uh, Linux install, you'll find us. And then you can check out our other work, Waltz, over at geovec.com, J-E-V-A-C-K.com. It's also in the show notes. Joe and Greg are doing another podcast called What I'm Playing Now, and I'm doing a new one called DevOps Mastery. So you can check all of our new stuff out at all of our new sites. And what should everybody go do, Joe? Go and install some Linux. Have a good week, everybody. Have a good week. Eat hot dogs. Okay, as long as they're made with Linux. Yeah, open source hot dogs. <laughs> open source go. open source pork. Free, free range open source. <laughs> Tastes like chicken. Have, have mm. a nice week. Yeah, no. <laughs> have a nice week, everybody.